What I work on primarily is prehistoric and early Japanese art and archaeology, uh, and that's going to be the subject of my dissertation. And some of my dissertation work I may talk about a little bit today, um, depending on the time and how many questions we have. But um, primarily what I'm going to talk about today is ways of really um, discussing how we visually analyze works like the one you see on the screen here. Um, and really how to contextualize these types of artifacts um, within Japanese prehistoric culture. Also, many of the images I'm going to focus on today are actually upstairs in the Japanese Prehistoric Japan Gallery. So you can actually go and check some of those out um, after we're done with the lecture today, or whatever this <laughs> the discussion. I don't want to, before I do begin, I do want to say that I'm going to leave some time to ask questions at the end and times very uh, throughout kind of my presentation. But really, if something comes up and you want to ask a question, just feel free to go ahead and ask me because I work much better that way. Um, and I want people to have their questions fresh in mind. All right, I'm going to just get started then. So I'm going to start today talking about this image on the screen here just a little bit. Uh, this work is a clay figurine in the shape of a soldier, which is on display here at the Asian Art Museum. And I just kind of want to ask everybody, just when we start here, looking at this object, what do you think, what are some of the visual cues that might tell us that this is a soldier image? Yeah. Armature. Armature, yes. He's got this kind of riveted armor that's on his body there. He has a sword or a big knife. Sword and knife. Excellent. Helmet. Helmet. Exactly. So I mean this is kind of a simplistic way of just starting, but this is also kind of the first step in really coming to visually analyze these works. Um, so armor, sword, helmet soldier, right? Now, this work is a type of work, uh, early Japanese uh, art or artifact known as a haniwa. Uh, and these are created primarily during the Kofun period from about 250 to 710 AD. And they were placed on the tops of tombs, uh, usually numbering in the tens to hundreds, depending on the size of the tomb. Now, we don't really have any text that tells what this work is. Its designation as soldier really comes from art historians and archaeologists' kind of visual identification of these various elements of sword, armor, helmet, what we just did. Um, and the term haniwa itself is just a descriptive term. It literally means clay circle, and it refers to that portion at the bottom there, that cylindrical tube part, which we think was buried in the earth and allowed the uh, sculptures to stamp upright uh, on tops of tombs. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, now, without knowing anything else about the Kofun period when this, was, or when this was created, there's a lot of information that we can actually just derive from the object itself. The armor and clothing of the work, for instance, tell us that um, these are the types of uniforms, the types of clothing that were being worn by warriors during this period from 250 to 710. What are some other things that you might be able to just draw out information-wise from this object? Yeah. Posture, yeah. yeah. So straight, erect. And then his hand on the sword is almost, um, you know, it seems like it's a warning. Like it's not the sword just by his side. It's ready to draw. And that's an excellent <laughs> observation. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But um, no, that's really good. Um, so again, it shows this kind of maybe something related to the function there. Warning, a guarding. Mm -hmm. Maybe. What else? Yeah. Right. That means they were creating those type of pieces that could be really pottery. Right, exactly. So it's telling us something about the technological capabilities of the Kofun period. The fact that they're able to kind of use this very fine type of clay, able to sculpt it. And these actually uh, figurines can be quite large about from the floor about this tall. Um, and the ability to really just create that and be able to fire it without it shattering is a technological accomplishment and tells us a little bit about the abilities. Also, going back to kind of the armor and the swords, it tells us that they also had at least some kind of access to metal, whether or not they were creating these uh, works, uh, sometimes up in the air. But they were at least able to um, obtain them somehow, uh, possibly through trade or possibly through manufacturing them themselves. Now, what we understand about the actual function of the work um, I mean, we have some hints just by looking at it, but when we get into the contextual details uh, of other elements of Kofun period history, then we start to uh, 
understand a bit more about what these were used for and why they were on the tops of tombs. Um, since Hanuar discovered almost exclusively on the tops of tombs, um, of mounded tombs like this one you see here, this is actually the tomb of Emperor Nintoku, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, but we assume that the sculpture served its uh, funerary purpose. Also, if we look at other cultures um, from this period and basically throughout history, the use of figural sculpture and burial practices is extremely common. Um, this is just an example from China, uh, from the Han Dynasty, which is about 206 BC to 220 AD. Um, but there are many uh, tombs from this period that included various figurines made of wood, made of stone, made of other types of materials. And these figures, at least in Chinese history, were intended to serve as stand-ins for human sacrifice. Um, earlier in Chinese history, uh, person servants, uh, usually an aristocrat or noble, someone of a higher status, when they died, they would have their wives, concubines, servants, cooks, animals killed and thrown into the tomb with them. And they were intended to accompany them into the afterlife. Um, when Confucius came around, he argued against this practice, uh, rightfully claiming that it's fairly wasteful to just throw your manpower into tombs. Um, and so the practice stopped, but what happened instead is they started to create uh, figurines, which Confucius wasn't terribly happy with either, but they started to create figurines and place these within tombs uh, to stand in for this human sacrifice practice. And the figurines themselves were supposed to serve the same purpose. They would be figurines of warriors, servants, and they were intended to go with the soul into the afterlife and essentially um, perform that function in the afterlife, being the servants of the deceased. Now this is a tomb from about 180 BC of the Han Dynasty. Uh, a fairly famous tomb, uh, the tomb of Lady Dai, or Ma Wang Dui tomb. Um, and you can kind of make out on the right there, it's not a great image, uh, but there's these piles of figurines. Um, they look almost like clothespins, actually, if you get a better look at them. Uh, but they're painted and they have clothing on. Um, and there again, they take the form of various members of um, Lady Dai's household, uh, servants, cooks, um, administrators. Uh, the tomb, or the the tomb is, well, to, is there a pointer on here at all? <laughs> um, well, so the middle portion is actually the a coffin. So the rest of it is just kind of built around the coffin. It's not huge, but um, it's in a huge pit. And I have never seen it, so I don't know the exact size. It's, it's not upright. Right, this is kind of overhead looking down. Yeah. Um, and then there's all this other stuff, as you can kind of get an idea of, just around the tomb. There's pottery, there's clothing in boxes on the left here. Um, above is actually plates of food. And these are objects that we usually call grave goods or burial goods. Um, and again, these were serving the same function. They were going to accompany the soul into the afterlife, things that they thought that the soul might need after death. Yeah? Similar to the Right. Exactly, and that's what I was going to say, is that this practice of burial goods is found worldwide. Egypt, like I think, is the most readily available example was the Egyptian tombs. But also, you see it in Korea, you see it in Greek and Macedonian burials, um, and you see it in Japan, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, so during the Kofun period of Japan, we do find evidence of cross-cultural contact between Japan and the kingdoms of Korea and China. And there seems to have been some frequent immigration between Japan and the Korean Peninsula. Um, and early Chinese records, as um, I guess you guys were talking about yesterday, also indicate some interaction between uh, the Chinese Empire um, and various chieftains and rulers, uh, possibly uh, Princess Himiko, uh, during this kind of early period of Japanese history. But what this does tell us is that many of these cultural traditions probably interact with one another, and many of the um, uh, the actual burial traditions, the funerary traditions at Japan were probably in some ways related to what we see in East Asia. Whether or not these figurines function the same manner is something I would, will debate a little bit later, but there's a number of theories about what they were used for. But anyways, just to kind of come back to Hanyuan in general, uh, they started to be created at the beginning of the Kofun period, about 250, and the earliest forms are really just simple cylinders um, that were placed on the ground. And then around 400 or so, we start to see more of these figural forms start to appear. And really, the sheer variety of these types of works is astounding. Um, we have figures of warriors, we have figures of farmers, dancers, singers. 
Uh, this pair is also here at the Asian Art Museum, and this shows a pair of female shamans. Uh, and they have remnants of kind of red paint on their face and chest, which we think is supposed to be remnants of either face painting or tribal tattoos. Uh, they also have around their neck uh, these curved uh, jade beads that are called magatama, well jade and other materials as well, but magatama beads, uh, which most archaeologists have assumed are related to Japanese funerary um, or ritual shamanistic practices. Um, not so much funerary, but kind of these uh, ritual practices. We can't. <laughs> That's more of an assumption. And there are some other, um, some of the figurines will have prominent breasts and it's uh, fairly, we, we're fairly certain that they're female, but there's no direct link to that. What's that? How did I come up with it? This is not I mean, my, no, not oh, oh, no. Is it referring to the um, Yeah. Again, it's because they have this kind of strange headdress, a strange face paint, and these maga, these beads that are usually thought to be ritual practices. But um, one of the things to really point out is that we don't know for sure. Um, I mean, then we have the records from China that talk about Himiko as kind of the shamanistic leader, um, and some of these kind of get brought into our interpretations of what this might be. But the fact that they're wearing what seems to be some kind of ritualistic garb, it, they get categorized as shaman or some kind of ritual worker. Um, but to go back to the Magatama just briefly, uh, a lot of these curve shaped beads are found also in Korea, um, large numbers of them. Uh, and again, this shows this cross-cultural interaction between Japan, uh, prehistoric Japan and early Korean kingdoms, um, and a lot of the cultural kind of confluence between the two. It's really hard to draw boundaries between where one culture begins and another ends during this period. They are very fluid with one another. Yeah. Are there any with wider shoulders? Um, I can't think of any with wider shoulders. They're usually, I think just in the way that they're constructed, they're usually fairly kind of tubular in shape and then the arms just kind of come off. Um, Right. Um, again, it's hard to tell because some of these, I mean, this one is fairly more distinct in that it's got kind of this whole flared armor. But um, this image, for instance, there's really not a lot to go on. It's very indistinct. It, there's call it a farmer, but it just looks like a generic um, figurine of a human. So really trying to pull into these certain details about it, it, it gets a little bit messy. Because they weren't exact, it wasn't an exact size <laughs> to be sure. And it may be that these are not intended to be gendered representations. They could be multiple gendered. Uh, we just don't know. Um, but yeah, so just again, this is a farmer, but there's no real indication of that for sure. That's just kind of a label that's been attached to it. Um, but we also have, in addition to um, more of these indistinct figurines and human figurines, a lot of uh, animal figures, in particular horses, complete with kind of the horse riding gear, all of the horse tack um, depicted on it. Can you guess what this might be? Yeah. Um, this is a very, very famous piece from the Tokyo National Museum. Um, and really it's amazing that this was created 1400 years ago, but these details, these um, elements of what we consider to our modern eye to be a dog are still very recognizable to us today. We have the lolling tongue, what looks to be like a collar hanging off. Um, it's just immediately recognizable to us. This is another very famous pair at the Tokyo National Museum. But again, we don't have a lot of information. This is probably one of the more uh, abstract depictions of Hanima that are out there. And they're called dancers, but again. Right. Yeah, exactly. They, they seem to be dancing, and that's maybe what they were doing. But aside from what we kind of draw into it, it's hard to tell exactly what these are representations of. Um, now, one of the things that's so intriguing about Hanyuwa is they really give off this air of playfulness and really an approachability, almost a kind of acuteness. Um, and as you would expect, um, well, despite the fact they're a kind of a prehistoric culture, again, we can identify these very human, very animal, recognizable characteristics even today. Um, and I think what it does is it gives us really people of any age to kind of be able to get a 
this kind of playfulness really draws people in um, and also gives us ability to connect with people of the past and begin to understand prehistoric artists responsible for these um, and why they were creating these works just through this kind of approachability of these works. But as I was going to mention, uh, this approachability uh, has also been glommed on by popular culture within Japan. Um, people are ecstatic to see these works at the Tokyo National Museum and to buy uh, tchotchkes everywhere related to Haniwa. Um, and youth culture in particular has really kind of uh, become attached to these kind of prehistoric depictions in Haniwa in particular. You see them in card games, you see them in video games. Uh, I think that's a fairly recent game on the right there. But again, lots of Han very distinct Haniwa pictures. Also, if we look at movies and uh, contemporary anime, uh, which you'll, I think you'll be talking about a bit more tomorrow, but uh, in particular, Studio Ghibli films with Miyazaki Hayao, um, and a lot of these movies that we've seen in America, like Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke here, um, really seem to draw on a lot of these kind of prehistoric, early uh, Japanese imagery. Uh, in particular, these Kodama figures from uh, Princess Mononoke have what looks to me, at least to my eye, very distinctly Haniwa-like characteristics. Now, one important element to keep in mind when looking at Haniwa, or really any prehistoric artifact, is that um, they were created during a period where we have no surviving writing. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, early writing was imported to Ch uh, from China and Korea probably sometime between the 4th and 6th centuries. But really the first surviving history we have Japan comes from about 712. Um, with later works of art, um, things that come from the non-prehistoric periods, we have plenty of cultural history texts, uh, literary texts, uh, texts about the work of art itself that really help give us a contextual basis for the works. Um, but with prehistoric works, we don't have these supplementary materials um, to help us understand the object. And really the artifact itself becomes our primary document. Through examination of an artifact and then comparison with other objects or archaeological data, that's how we begin to understand the culture and really to begin to develop theses and ideas about what these objects might be and what they might have been used for. Yeah. So, do you ever get into conflicting arguments about what a specific object looks like somebody else's In my department, no, because nobody else works on these things in my department. <laughs> but within the um, within archaeological um, text, there's, it's always just arguments about what these things might be. Right. I mean, the nice thing about Haniwa um, is that some of them are very distinct in what they are. Um, but I don't think anyone's really arguing about this one because there's just not as much going on. But we usually, when people are talking about Haniwa, they try to do it in more of a broad um, basis. And the focus has always been usually on these very distinct elements as opposed to the ones that are harder to identify. But yes, there's a lot of debate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, in, is there any other questions so far before I move on? Yeah. You know, there's no evidence that there was for these items, but certainly before the 712 text, uh, there was likely records being kept. Certainly by the seventh century, uh, we have, um, so what we have in 712, uh, I'm trying to remember my dates, I believe that's the Kojiki, mm -hmm. uh, which is the first chronicle of Japan, and then shortly after that, the Nihon Shoki, which are these mythological histories of Japan that kind of, as they get, they, they start with Japanese prehistory and then they move to kind of what was then contemporary Japan, so about the early 8th century. And as it gets closer to the present day, it starts to get much more distinct and much more historically, or what we think historically accurate. So probably what those are are kind of an amalgamation of oral tales about kind of Japanese prehistory, and then these records that, were, that we no longer have anymore, that are now lost, but probably records from the 6th and 5th, or 6th and 7th centuries. But before that, it's hard to say because we just don't have any, anything surviving. And we do occasionally have, um, I'll, I'll talk about them later, I have them later in my presentation, but they're these bronze mirrors um, that 
often have engraved Chinese characters on them. Uh, most of them are imported from China, so that those characters are actually Chinese people writing them. But occasionally we have one that was mint, or, uh, made in Japan, and they have kind of very rough characters that look like they're almost just mimicking Chinese. They don't make any sense, usually, and they're usually they have a lot of errors in them, so it seems to be that they're trying to start to kind of adapt Chinese into Japan. And really this was, the first written language was Chinese in Japan. But yeah, we don't have any evidence until about really 8th century. That's when we have our first solid text coming out. Um, I'm going to continue talking about this guy just a little bit more. But when looking at a Hanyuwa like this, usually the first step I go through in trying to understand what this work is, is to just look at the object itself. Um, and there's a few fundamental questions I usually ask myself about this work, about prehistoric works, and really any art in general. And there are things like, what is it made out of? How was it made? What is being depicted? Um, and these questions, I mean, these are just kind of a basic first starting point for trying to begin to understand. Um, and some of these questions are harder to, harder to answer, like how is it made is not necessarily readily available. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, there is certainly, I mean, uh, kind of a move to more technologically advanced forms as we get to uh, later. As I mentioned, the figure forms don't develop until about 400. But even within the Haniwa, it's very variable. Like we can have something like this, which is fairly complex, or the horse, and then the farmer image right next to it. So it wasn't so much that there was necessarily a, you know, it's not a plottable time versus complexity curve or anything like that. It's just some are probably just created by more talented artisans and some are not. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that design-like thing at the end of his left arm, is that supposed to be attached to something or is it supposed to be seen? Or right, and I think if we go back to the warrior, I think he has the same the thing. Same Right, and I think it's probably part of the armor that they're wearing, likely some kind of arm guard. So probably what we have with this person is another warrior figure, um, although he has, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say because he's got that very, what looks to, at least my eyes, kind of a pilgrim-like hat even. Um, but then he's got these arm guards that are very similar to the warrior arm guards, so it's hard to tell. Probably a warrior, maybe something else. Maybe that was just the fashion at the time. Um, but yeah, usually from that first kind of interaction with the piece, that first visual kind of recognition of different elements of it, um, that's when I start to ask, at least when I'm doing my research of these, the more contextual questions such as, how does this Haniwa compare to other works that were created during this period? Um, how is it different? How is it similar? Um, what other types of objects were being created in general during the Kofun period? What objects were being created during, you know, in the specific region or other objects that were found in the region? And then from there, that's when I start to work into the interpretive questions like, how were Hanima used? Or what was the intent of this work? Why was it on top of tombs? And how did it incorporate into funerary practices? Yeah. How big is that, would you say, roughly? This, one, this one's actually in the Asian Art Museum, and I can't remember exactly. But this is only about half of the image. The bottom half is actually broken off. So it's probably about the size. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah, most of them are pretty big. Like, usually about this high from the floor. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but um, I mean, there, and it also depends on the type. Like some of the animal Haniwa might be a little smaller. There are bird Haniwa, for instance, but then the figural ones are usually pretty tall. Um, but an important thing to keep in mind, again, that is because there are no texts to tell us what these things are. There are no fixed meanings whatsoever. Um, and it's very likely that four prehistoric peoples that were looking at these things are probably were more than one meaning. Um, multiple layers of significance based on the context that these objects were seen in, the, what people were actually looking at these objects, uh, different uh, people at different levels of um, uh, kind of a social hierarchy probably saw different things in these works. 
Um, and really in my own classes, when I'm teaching undergraduates, this is what I try to really stress to my students, that because there is no fixed meanings, um, they can really have free reign to begin to develop these ideas, these meanings for themselves. Um, before I really explain what a work of art is, I do like to have my students just look at the work and begin to uh, spitball ideas, kind of like we did at the beginning today. Um, and then really, I usually from there, I'll, I'll start to develop in a little bit more of the contextual information, maybe explaining a little bit more about the period, about the history, about where these objects were found, and then give it back to them to, again, begin to try to make the contextual uh, meaning of these works, to begin to really develop from themselves before I lay to, or like this layer on the, um, <coughs> the scholarly interpretations. Um, just let them have a chance to develop these ideas from their own. And because there really is no right or wrong answer with a lot of these things, um, it's, everything's really on the table for them. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start talking a little bit about the actual historical context for Japanese prehistory uh, and discuss a few other types of artifacts coming from various points within Japanese prehistory. But before I move away from Haniwa, I will come back to them um, in a little more detail in a little bit. But does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just a fashionable hairdo. <laughs> This is the only one I've seen with that hairdo, though, um, so it's hard to tell. Um, I actually, whenever I see this, I just think Amish man, but <laughs> that's obviously not right. <laughs> um, all right, so just to briefly go over what Japanese prehistory is, it's divided into roughly four main periods, the Paleolithic, Jomon, Yayoi, and then the Kofun period that we were just talking about. Um, keep in mind, all these dates are approximate. Uh, depending on what scholar you ask, they'll change around. But this is kind of the basic layout. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Paleolithic period. Uh, I honestly don't know very much about it. Um, but mostly it's stone tools, chipped axes, arrowheads. Uh, not necessarily what I'm interested in. Um, the Jomon period we'll start with, and that's an extremely long period of time, as you can see here, lasting over 10,000 years. Um, and really the, the first period that people, um, the first period where we start to see art developing in Japan, or art as we know it. Uh, it's when we start to see pottery for the first time being developed. Now, during the Jomon period, Japan was inhabited by hunter-gatherer tribes. Uh, they hunted, fished, gathered plants and nuts, uh, and maybe practiced some limited farming. Uh, that one's up for debate. Uh, there were partially nomadic, we think, setting up kind of temporary settlements and then moving during different seasons depending on the availability of food or other resources. Um, and this is a recreation of what, one of the many recreations of what archaeologists think they might have been living in during this period. Uh, it's what's known as a pit house and it's essentially a pit that's dug out and then covered with kind of um, a thatch and whatnot. But we don't have any real good evidence aside from the remaining holes that we've found uh, during excavation. Now, probably the most, or the best comparison for thinking about the Jomon period is actually the tribes that, the Native American tribes that used to inhabit the Bay Area here and also up and down the northwestern coast. Um, same style of lifestyle, same, they were practicing probably the same amount of fishing and gathering of nuts. Now, one of the most interesting groups of artifacts from this period is another type of clay figurine called a dogu. And these two, are, again, are displayed here at the Asian Art Museum. And they're coming from the late Jomon period, so that 100 or 1000 to 300 BC period. Um, and really, dogu have been found throughout Japan and were created through many of the, most of the Jomon period, so almost for 10,000 years or so. Um, and given that there's this a large time period when these were created, uh, by various hunter-gatherer groups within Japan, um, there really is a wide vari a variety of types of dogu that we find. And to give you just a little bit of sense of this type of variety, this is an exhibit from the British Museum in 2009 that had a, a good collection of these works. And again, this is another famous work from the Tokyo National Museum. Now, looking at this work, how might you describe its appearance? Yes. Yes. And then the eyes, I'm curious about the eyes. What's with the eyes? Because all 
the eyes in all of them seem to be specific or big. Right. And it's almost a kind of an alien-like uh -huh. presence. Yeah. yeah. I'll come back to the eyes in just a second. <laughs> Anything else that you can kind of take out of this? Yeah. To me, it seems very um, like female. Yes. Um, and that's an excellent observation. That's actually most scholarly observ or interpretations of this have been along those lines. Now, this is a lot more abstract than the Hanuma we've been looking at. Um, at least it's not nearly as recognizable as a human even, um, at least for our eyes. Um, and while archaeologists do have several series about the significance of this work, it's again important to point out that we don't have any texts that tell us what this is, and this is mostly based on contextual information. Um, many of these works are found at ritual sites, suggesting that they may have been used in shamanistic practices. Um, however, many others have been found in other widely varying uh, contexts. Uh, they've been found in funerary contexts. They've been found buried under houses. They've been found discarded in waste heaps. Um, so this, again, suggests that there were multiple meanings for these works and multiple, multiple uses, um, especially if you're looking at a time period that's 10,000 years long, probably changing meanings throughout the entire time period as well. Despite that, we do have some prominent theories about what they were used for. Um, many scholars have argued that they were used in healing rituals. Um, most of the doga that have been recovered usually are kind of in this fragmentary state, um, usually with limbs broken off um, or just shattered. Um, and archaeologists say that probably these works were used in kind of a um, sympathetic healing ritual where if somebody had perhaps broken their leg, the leg of Adogu would have been broken off in order to kind of encourage healing of the person. Hmm. And then another theory is because they have prominent nipples, um, that they might be female fertility goddesses and um, were scattered or buried throughout villages in order to help promote heal or fertility among women in the village but also to um, maybe promote crops, promote the availability of resources. But again, we're not entirely sure. And one of the big problems with the, at least the healing ritual theory is that, yes, they are broken, but these things are not terribly, they're, yeah, they're fairly fragile. And when you put something in the earth for 10,000 years, especially in a region prone with earthquakes and moving of soil, uh, yeah, the theory doesn't, it doesn't hold up. And again, also, the fertility goddess theory, there are certainly images that have penises um, or are both genders, and it's hard to say that it's one or the other. Um, and really what we don't have, at this point, all we really have are theories. We have a vague understanding that these works were likely used in rituals. And unlike Hanua, these uh, works were only rarely used in funerals. Also, unlike Hanua, they are much more abstract, like I mentioned, uh, vaguely representing human forms, but they don't tell us quite as much about Joman period society as the Hanua do. Um, we don't really know what they were wearing, for instance, just by looking at this work. Um, and again, to go back to the eyes, what many archaeologists have claimed is that um, probably these are representations of a type of goggle, um, a snow goggle, where two shells were kind of placed close together, just leaving a little slit for the eyes. And this would have protected against wind and snow during the winter when they're trouncing around. Yeah. This, I believe, is from uh, Hokkaido. Yeah, and that's where that, that kind of, um, that's where the idea originally came from, was looking at Inuit peoples. And a lot of the Jomon, um, or at least uh, research about the Jomon period has taken a lot from uh, discussing Inuit populations uh, and archeology. span But I'm not sure we've ever found any of these goggles, unfortunately, in Japan, so it's hard to know for sure. Um, I know I've kind of just rushed through the Jomon period, but does anyone have any questions? Yeah. It's likely they had some kind of tattooing or body painting. Uh, we have found bones that do have remnants of um, cinnabar paint on them, so we know that the bones were at least were painted sometimes. But um, so that's probably not clothing, that's it might be, or it might be tattoos. Yeah, 
because it does kind of almost have like a flaring skirt, but this is so abstract in its design to begin with. And if it's a depiction of some kind of um, abstract deity, even then it's hard to say whether we can interpret it as clothing or not. All right. Um, so the Jomon period ended about 400 BC, uh, and this corresponds to about the time where the Japanese people began to practice wet rice agriculture and began to use metal tools. Um, and excavations from this period, uh, the Ayoi period, uh, show that people were living in more permanent villages, often with these extensive irrigation canals and rice paddies. Now the use of metal tools in complex uh, wet rice agriculture is uh, quite a technological jump from what we're seeing during the Jomon period from hunting, gathering, and uh, mostly pottery technologies, um, and a nomad, uh, at least a partially nomadic lifestyle. So likely this change in lifestyle was caused by an influx of cultural and technological influence coming from mainland Asia, and most likely from immigrants coming from the Korean Peninsula. And this is again a recreation of one of these uh, Yayoi villages. Now one of the distinctive types of objects that began to be produced during the Yayoi period it was a bronze bell called a dotaku, which literally means bronze bell. Um, and they range from really quite small, almost this size, to uh, fairly large. And this is again an example from the Asian Art Museum um, that is a more a larger variety. Um, Usually these works were found buried in groups on the tops of hillsides um, and often overlooking farmland below. And again, this seems to have been unrelated to kind of a funerary tradition. Instead, these works were buried as part of a separate ritual. Um, and the proximity, proximity of these bells usually to kind of ideal farmland has caused archaeologists to, uh, to come with the theory that maybe they were used in a kind of a fertility ritual associated with farming, perhaps for rain or what have you. But bronze bells are by no means limited to Japan. Uh, a famous set of bronze bells uh, from around this period were excavated from, uh, in China from the tomb of Marquis of Yi. Uh, these Chinese bells have a completely different function than those that were found in Japan, uh, where the Japanese bells were buried on tops of hills, unrelated to, um, to graves. Uh, these, these bells in particular were buried as a grave good, buried within the tomb of the Marquis uh, intended as a prestige object that was, in, uh, that was gonna follow him into the afterlife. And it was also, I think, part of a much larger collection of instruments that were buried in one of the chambers of his tomb. <coughs> now, beside, despite this difference in use, there is some evidence that shows us that this is um, of a cross-cultural interaction between China and Japan during this period. The mere fact that bronze working is being practiced in Japan shows that the technology and the materials were coming into Japan from abroad, and also the idea to really cast them in um, sometimes, not, not in this case, but sometimes the bell form is uh, similar to what we see in East Asia. Um, it does show us that some of these ideas and technological innovations were beginning to show up in Japan. I'm gonna move through the Yayoi period now just to get back to the Kofun period. The Ayoi period is actually a fairly uh, short period of time. Um, and at the end of the period, that's where we think Princess Himiko uh, may have come about, about 250 a uh, AD. So this is back to the Kofun period again. This is the period from about 250 to uh, 710. Um, and again, it's named for the large tomb mounds that started to be created during this period. Uh, the name Kofun literally means old tomb, and it's a name both for the t entire time period, and also these tombs themselves are known um, in Japanese as Kofun. Now the tombs generally consist of a small stone-lined chamber um, inside, of the, uh, inside of the tomb, or a trench that's dug on top of it, where a body and grave goods would be buried, and then this large constructed mound of earth. Uh, in this case, this is the tomb of Emperor Nintoku, which is the largest tomb in Japan, and what we have they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but the most distinctive and the largest tombs usually have this very um, unique keyhole shape, where you have a tomb mound at the top there that's just a kind of a rounded piece of earth, and then coming off at the bottom, a, uh, a flatter uh, kind of what might have been a ritual platform, but uh, again, it creates this keyhole-like shape. And then around it, at least in this case, we have several moats, so that lighter green area is actually water um, filled with algae. Yeah. 
Yeah, this isn't a great image. And I realized when I was looking over this last time, I was like, oh, that looks like grass or forest. But no, yeah, so we have, again, in the middle of the, the tomb and then all covered with trees. Then the water, then another ring of trees, another moat, another ring of trees, and then a final moat. And actually, nobody's allowed to um, actually go in this tomb anymore. It's considered still sacred space. Uh, possible connections to the current imperial line. Um, it might be Korean. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a testy topic in Japan. Um, but, and really, if you go to see this on the ground, this is obviously a very far up aerial view, but on the ground, it just looks like a hill with trees. Um, and probably originally, they weren't covered with trees. They were probably clear cut, and then they've just grown back over time. But to give a kind of a sense of the size of these tombs, uh, this is a scale model um, at the nearby museum where we have Emperor Nintoka's tomb at the bottom there, and then on top are the pyramids of Giza. So pretty much similar in scale, if not quite as uh, vertically tall. <laughs> and the sheer size does indicate something about Japanese rulers during this period. Um, they had enough power, they had consolidated enough of their uh, rule in order to essentially amass the manpower needed to make these giant mounds of earth. Uh, we do think that during this period also that we start to see the development of a um, centralized Japanese government uh, with many of the kind of localized chieftains beginning to consolidate and create a, uh, a power. And during this period we see the beginnings of the imperial family line that would begin to really um, make an impact in Japanese history as we know it during the 7th and 8th centuries. Um, now one of the things that I've been most interested in my research is really examining the religious significance of tombs uh, and what they indicate about early Japanese ideas about death and the afterlife. Um, these tombs were created before Shintoism had really been formalized in Japan and certainly before the introduction of Buddhism. Um, which really only started to catch hold within, Jap within the Japanese population around the 5th or 6th centuries. Artifacts found in conjunction with tombs, however, do give us some ideas of what these tombs might have meant to the people of the period. As I mentioned earlier, Haniwa were placed on tops of the tombs. In the case of Emperor Nin Nintoku, there were thousands of these placed on top. I think the number that I remember is 40,000 were originally on top of this tomb. <clears throat> and again, this shows the ability of the rulers of this period to really kind of amass this manpower to create these objects. <coughs> Pardon me. And then one of the theory that I alluded to earlier is that Haniwa might have been a stand-in for human sacrifice. Similar to what we see in Chinese tombs, the figurines may have accompanied the soul into the afterlife, serving as warriors and entertainers for the deceased in, um, after death. And in this case, they would have functioned similar to what um, the terracotta warriors might have functioned as. Um, which were, uh, again, we had, there was an exhibit here I guess, a couple of months ago, it just recently closed, but um, hundreds and thousands of these life-size terracotta warriors that surrounded the tomb of the first Qin Emperor in about 710 BC. However, unlike the terracotta warriors, um, these were all buried around the tomb. The Haniwa themselves were never buried within the tomb itself. They always were placed on tops of the tomb. Um, and this does make it a little bit hard to say that these were f uh, functioning in the place of human sacrifices, or at least hard to uh, make this connection to China or Korea, where perhaps they were functioning as sac or, uh, stand ins. Also, we don't have any evidence in Japan of human sacrifice ever being practiced. Yeah. Right, and we just, we just don't see, I mean, it's possible it happened occasionally, but at least widespread evidence is, there's none to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, so y there are thousands, probably, of Kofun Nobody's tombs. Are allowed to go inside any of them? No, just, just some of them. So, so the ones that have been designated as imperial tombs are really under the protection of the Imperial Household Agency in Japan. Um, and they don't allow people, they don't allow archaeologists, they don't allow really anyone to have access to them. Although there is an Imperial Household Agency, like, archaeological team that's basically in charge of going in and kind of sprucing up the tombs. Um, but it's only, I think there are probably several hundred that are under direct uh, protection and aren't allowed to be really fussed with. But um, again, there's many, many more tombs. 
um, and they're really everywhere. Uh, they range from kind of this size to sometimes they just look like a small hill. <laughs> they're, um, and a lot of these smaller ones are, it's, it's almost hard to determine what's a kofun sometimes. You'll just be walking through Japan and there'll be a, kind of a, a wooded hill next to you and it's like, oh, well that's a kofun. Do you have like pot hunters or rooters? Um, not usually, but what has happened in the past, so there, were, there were looters probably, most of them have been looted several centuries ago. So often what will happen is they'll, um, archaeologists will get permission to excavate the tomb, and when they open it up, there's really nothing left inside. Um, and this tomb, I think there is still stuff inside of it because um, I think an object was found once by a child who had kind of snuck in and apparently crawled through. There's this whole story about a child who swam the moats and crawled through a hole after a storm and found all this stuff. So there might be something in there. <laughs> um, but again, so the, the fact that t of these Haniwa are not found within the tomb probably makes it unlikely that they're used for sacrifices. Um, and usually what happens when we find these uh, figurines is that they're actually placed in rings, um, concentric rings around the edge of the tomb, especially the burial mound itself. Um, so likely what they were standing for, at least in my opinion, is that they were probably indicators of where a tomb began, separating kind of the holy space of the tomb from the surrounding more mundane world, and probably acting as uh, guardian figures, as you mentioned very <laughs> early on. But that fact that he is kind of in a threatening pose was probably uh, both to ward off maybe looters or whoever who may have seen them in the forest and gotten scared away, or um, malicious spirits, probably, from getting into the tomb area. And again, this is a smaller tomb. This is the Fujinoki tomb. Uh, that's actually the subject of my dissertation, but you can kind of get a sense here of a difference in scale. This is much, much smaller than what we were looking at before. <clears throat> um, now, bodies were usually buried in either wood or stone coffins, and they were either found in a trench, again, along the top of the burial mound, or in later tombs, we have these stone line constructed chambers, um, often with passages that led into the tomb that were then sealed after the tomb was um, finished, and after all the body and burial goods were uh, placed inside. And there are, um, in the tombs that haven't been looted, that have been excavated, they've found a variety of different burial goods, from jars to pottery to jewelry, um, and some very extravagant objects. Um, very often we find weaponry and um, armor as well in tombs. And this may have been a connection to kind of the military might of a lot of these Kofun period rulers. Um, and that placing of these objects within the tomb is supposed to, again, allow them to continue to have this power in the afterlife or to at least show their status as a prominent ruler in life. <clears throat> this sword on the left is again at the Asian Art Museum here. Um, and it's got this kind of ring-shaped pummel with what has often been described as a phoenix head design inside of it. Um, and this design is actually a Korean style sword and likely this was imported to Japan uh, during the Kofun period and then buried within the tomb of the uh, ruler. On the right side is one of those bronze mirrors I was talking about. Uh, this is a Chinese designed one uh, that was imported to Japan. Um, when I say mirror, what you're actually looking at here is the back side of the mirror, kind of a decorated back. Um, and the other side is uh, usually a slightly concave and then would have been polished to kind of a mirror finish. Uh, probably didn't show a reflection very well, but certainly would have been great at reflecting light and kind of moving light around. And again, most of the time these tombs are uh, have been looted when they, by the time they're excavated. But in the few unlooted tombs that we've found, there have been some fairly extravagant objects discovered. Um, this is a <clears throat> actually the front part of a saddle, um, and it's a bronze work that's been covered in gold, and it's extremely <laughs> extravagant. In the, I mean, there's also, I think, glass beads attached to it. Um, and um, as you can see here, this kind of extravagant metal work uh, where there's a number of different designs that are still visible. On the, I think on the right side you can kind of see an elephant, and up here on the left there's uh, actually a phoenix design um, and some ogre figures also um, on the works. And this again also comes from the Fujinoki tomb. So if mirrors weren't a true reflection, what were they used 
Uh, we think at least, well, the, the practice of burying mirrors actually starts within, I think, I think it starts in the Han Dynasty, if not before, in China. Uh, and usually what they were thought to have been used, probably they were used um, at least in some capacity for reflecting your face, and um, they're often found with uh, makeup sets, but probably they're also used to reflect light and kind of bring light into places. Um, and that might have some connection to what their actual function within the tomb was, maybe to brighten the tomb. Um, it's hard to say, but there are a number of Chinese texts that talk about using mirrors to kind of reflect light and create light in different areas. <clears throat> so one last thing I just want to talk about briefly, um, that also dating to the Kofun period, we have the earliest examples of Japanese painting that have survived. <clears throat> Although these are not terribly common, some tombs did have paintings on the walls and the of the burial chambers. And one example is the Chibusan tomb here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, located in Kumamoto Prefecture, and it dates around the 6th century. Um, and we have paintings in this area that there's a little constructed platform inside of the tomb chamber. Um, and if you can see on the right there, that little pile of rocks is probably where the body would have been placed. And then around that, we have all of these um, triangles and circles and other images that have been painted. <clears throat> and again, it's not entirely clear what we're seeing here, but what's usually been interpreted is probably a shaman-like figure on the left here. Um, again, this headdress that this person is wearing, maybe a bird-like headdress, also is similar to some of the things that we start to see on Haniwa figures during this period. And the triangle, it's also been interpreted that maybe these yellow dots are stars. It's hard to say, but um, in general, the use of triangles, and in, partic uh, in particular, these kind of curved forms um, painted in red paint, uh, what are considered to be what we know as uh, apotropaic, or basically having a spiritual power on their own. By painting these images within the tomb, either they were conferring power onto the deceased, or um, being used as kind of a protection device to protect the soul of the deceased. This is another painted tomb, the Torozuka Kofun from the seventh century. And I find this one extremely interesting because what we have painted in this tomb seems to be not these kind of more abstract images, but actual depictions of objects, burial goods themselves. So the circles may have been plates. Um, we have depictions of uh, arrows, those kind of lines on the back, armor, helmets. Uh, so what we have here is instead of actual burial goods, which there may have been, um, I'm not sure about this tomb, but we also have um, paintings of burial goods that were intended to function basically the same purpose. The paintings would follow the soul into the afterlife and serve as actual objects. So you could keep the stuff and just paint it on the Exactly. <laughs> they were thinkers. <laughs> Uh, they probably are bowed a little bit. Um, but it is, uh, it is in a mound. Yes, so this would have been in a mound. And these are, I think this wall might actually be plastered. Yeah. No, no, it might well, be it stone. Like it's hard to say, like yeah. Most of the time they're just on the raw stone. Um, I don't quite have enough time to go through this last, well, maybe I can get through it very quickly. Um, so those were kind of the more abstract ones, but this is the last tomb I was going to talk about. This is one of the final tombs uh, created in Japan, the Takamatsuzuka tomb, from about 710, uh, or at the very least, the early 8th century. Uh, again, a smaller tomb. A lot of the tombs during the late Kofun period were much smaller in design, but had more intricate uh, burial chambers. But what we have here, this is just kind of an early picture um, of the archaeological uh, excavation team. is actually a completely plastered interior space. And then each of the walls, we have um, these paintings. This is about probably 710, but early 8th century. And um, <clears throat> what we have here is a number of uh, different depictions of aristocrats, um, each wearing what seems to be Korean-style clothing. Um, we have, I think, four distinct groups, two groups of females and two groups of males. And then the picture on the right there, it's terrible picture and it's not really easy to uh, tell what's going on, but archaeologists have identified an umbrella being held by that guy in the middle and then somebody standing under the umbrella, which is thought to maybe have been a depiction of the deceased himself. What's that? The deceased. The deceased. Oh, the, yeah. The <laughs> oh, sorry. 
each of the tombs interiors have been photographed and are online. Is right. That, is that true with these? Or is it um, I think a lot of them have been photographed. This case is very unique to Japan because uh, most of the time they are on, like I said, stone. But because it's on plaster, a lot of the plaster has deteriorated over time. Um, so this is a picture of actually when they were going in. Um, they put in kind of fiber scope cameras to kind of take a picture of it before they actually opened it up. Yeah. But since then, all of these have been cut out because they were um, falling apart and there was a mold that was destroying things. Oh. And so they're in kind of a separate location now. And that's where we get, I think, these pictures from, these kind of high quality pictures. Yeah. Well, what we, th we think they're Korean because um, the kind of multicolored skirt that we see down below, um, I think examples of similar paintings uh, and maybe similar clothing remnants have been found in Korea. But again, the boundaries between Japanese and Korean culture during this period were very fluid. Um, and that probably a lot of the traditions that were happening in Japan during the early periods very related to Korea and probably hard to uh, differentiate in many cases. Yeah. So uh, on that topic, so this is the 8th century, um, and there's probably a cultural like, artifact continuum between Korea and Japan, right? right. Like where you can kind of compare and contrast. Right. There are limits, uh, like extremes uh, of geog geography of where you find things that are similar. Um, what, rewind four centuries before, which, mm -hmm. I guess those earlier pieces. Right, the Hanyuwa, yeah. Is there also that continuum, or do we find just much more of this continuum in the 8th century? Well, with the Hanyuwa, and a lot of the artifacts coming from that period, yes, a lot of those were coming from China and Korea, um, but mostly uh, those would have been the mirrors, uh, some arms and armor. Um, and actually, in Magatama beads, some of the shamanistic works were similar. On the other hand, a lot of the pottery is distinctly Japanese. The tradition of creating Haniwa itself is uh, distinctly Japanese. Um, and while there are some mounded tombs in southern Ch uh, Korea, nothing really to the same extent that we see in Japan, where it kind of just floods uh, most of the um, southeastern part of, uh, part of the country. So it, there is a continuum, and then there's also disjunct as well. So there is fluidity, but also kind of a breaking point. And just to kind of move through a couple of these quickly before I run out of time, um, because I do want to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, in addition to these actual figure um, groups that you see in this diagram here, uh, there were also images of uh, Taoist images of the four guardian deities of the four directions. So a white tiger on the left or on the west, uh, a what's called a dark warrior, which is essentially a turtle wrapped by a snake, on the north, and on the east a blue dragon. And likely on the south there would have been uh, the final member of the four guardians, a red bird. But um, this tomb was uh, looted centuries before, and this was actually where the grave robbers decided to create a shaft, so they destroyed that portion. And then on the ceiling we have a star map, which is actually a fairly accurate uh, celestial representation. Um, this actually comes from another tomb. I don't have a picture of the Takamatsuzuka one, but it's essentially the same style that was created. And these are found um, very frequently in Korean tombs. Um, as well. So it's thought that maybe a lot of these imageries um, are coming from Korea, especially the Taoist imagery itself, which is found frequently in Korea and in uh, China. So just to end uh, today, and then we can come back and talk about some of these things if you have any questions about them. But um, we've really covered a number of different types of burial objects uh, throughout Japanese history. Uh, the earliest works we talked about were these dogu from Japan's Jomon period, which seemed to have served a variety of functions from ritual healing artifact to a fertility object. Um, the Yayoi period had the dotaku, which uh, again has its origin with uh, the introduction of metallurgy uh, from China and Korea but also probably a distinct use as a, a burial object that was associated with uh, probably fertility rituals. Then in the Kofun period, we start to see the Haniwa, which were uh, unburied funerary objects um, used in funerary rituals, but not placed in the tomb with the deceased. And then within the Kofun themselves, these burial objects that were intended to go with the deceased into the afterlife, things that were fairly um, usually high prestige items and other objects that maybe the deceased would want in the afterlife. 
Again, though, I do want to stress that none of these meanings of any of these works are stable. Uh, there is no ancient Japanese text that tells what these things are. And really one of the interesting things about teaching prehistoric works of art is that there is room for students to make their own interpretation really about what these objects are and what they represent. And for them to think about these connections between um, what we see in these objects and the actual prehistoric past. All right, so I'm going to end there and just open up to questions. Yeah. Right, let me just swap back here. I'm gonna actually move over here just because I can point it out a little bit easier. But with Haniwa, usually what we have are, um, they're just around the edges of the sides of the kind of the main burial mound. Um, with the smaller tombs, usually it's just a few of them kind of just around the edges um, of the main circle. Right, and sometimes actually if there is, is a side chamber leading into the tomb, sometimes, um, uh, the honey will actually kind of make a passage to the tomb. That's not, I don't know how common that is, but, um, and then in the larger tombs like the Nintoku Kofun, I think they just kind of, there's like a forest of them. If there really was 40,000, um, then you probably couldn't go two feet without seeing one. Um, and then with the terracotta warriors, the terracotta warriors are actually buried around the tomb mound, um, so they weren't on top of the soil at all. Um, and most, I mean, when we find honey, well, yeah, usually they are buried, but that's usually just from natural processes. Usually they just break and they fall over after, you know, several centuries. But with the um, hunt, or with the terracotta warriors who are buried kind of around it, um, probably, again, serving probably a similar focus of um, protecting the deceased, but also intended to go into the uh, afterlife, serve as an army in the afterlife. And then if we're looking at the earlier Ma Wang Dui tomb, the figurines were actually buried in the tomb itself. Right. Um, with the when they actually have the structure inside of it, they probably built the structure first and then, and then put, the big, put the earth on top. But with um, tombs like this, this one actually I believe has a trench on top. It's a fairly extensive trench, but um, so then they would build the mound first and then dig the trench, put the body in. Yeah. So all of these Haniwa would have been found after they kind of like gotten buried through the Right. I mean, I'm sure it did happen <laughs> where people would walk off with them, but I think most of the time, um, yeah, we usually find them kind of slightly buried. Usually they're fragmentary and they have to put them back together. Um, they've fallen over. Uh, I've, I mean, I've never seen one that's standing up right anymore. Um, so how it's hard to say. Because like that's the number of, uh, I think, in distinct fragments of distinct okay. figurines. Wow. I could be wrong. It might have been. I could have been wrong when I read the original article. It could have been forty thousand fragments were found, but still, it indicates a large, large number of these. Yeah. Could you share a little bit about your experience in the politics of archaeology. You know, going to Japan yeah. and, and interacting with colleagues, and do you find that your Japanese uh, the people that you're working with in Japan are open to new ideas. You mentioned that there are also like, yeah. the imperial archaeologists who do a little sprucing up. But right. What, explain a little bit about you know, your um, experience. Your so I've had some experience. I'm actually going back uh, next month for my dissertation field work where I'm going to be working more directly with archaeologists at an archaeological center. But really, for the most part, um, everyone's very open to new ideas, very open to um, having um, there's been a lot of critique of the Japanese archaeological system in the past, um, especially in the last 20 years, for not adapting to kind of developments within Western archaeology, um, and also being kind of cloistered within kind of a Japanese system of archaeology. So there's been a lot more push to have this kind of international dialogue with new archaeologists. That being said, um, there are a lot of times where it's, you might just get a smile and the nod, like that's a good idea, but it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's going to happen anywhere where you have a, especially with someone who's fairly new to the field like me, coming in as a graduate student. <clears throat> but when you're kind of a, you've been in the uh, archaeological field for 50 plus years, um, the new whippersnappers ideas are not going to be totally accepted. Um, 
but that said, yeah, it is, it's a changing field more and more. Um, the idea of, uh, it was fairly early on proposed in the, I think the 80s or maybe 70s that Japanese archeologists were reluctant to discover these kind of Korean origins of the imperial line within Japan. Uh, that's a little bit of a myth. Uh, most archaeologists in Japan are very well aware of the Korean connections and that most of the imperial line either is descended from Koreans or that there's more, most likely it's kind of a mixture of um, some of the indigenous peoples and Korean bloodlines. And probably the culture that we see developing in Japan during this period, it's much less related to the hunter-gatherer Jomon and Yayoi people. And probably what has happened is that more of the, um, a large number of Korean immigrants kind of came over and mixed some with the native population, displaced some of them. Um, but to think of them as, as this as kind of a isolated, purely Japanese culture is a little bit of a myth. Um, the Imperial Household Agency that does kind of upkeep this, um, I think their official line is essentially that they don't want people going into these tombs because they are the, essentially the graves of the Imperial family's descendants, which is a fair argument, um, except for a lot of these designation of Imperial tombs were made arbitrarily in the Meiji period in the 19th century. Um, basically, uh, or survey crews went around and they, they looked at some of the larger tombs and usually it was kind of a, uh, just a rough estimate, like, oh, that's probably imperial. So there's a lot of debate with um, the kind of the academic archeologists and the rescue archeologists with the uh, Imperial Household Agency, because they want to go in and excavate. And it's very clear that the tomb is not imperial connected, but there still is a, a, the Imperial Household Agency is very reluctant to kind of give up these rights to look at these works. And there have been a couple occasions, usually it's once a year, once every couple of years where the Imperial Household Agency archaeologists will allow other archaeologists to kind of set foot onto the, the um, tomb and sometimes even set foot on top, but never excavate. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. How do you think with the water around it, though, for generations, would not do a food well for what was inside, other than maybe right. um, well, I think most of these kind of moated tomb, or tombs with moats, usually the optics are uh, on top of the burial mound at the oh. very top. Um, so with the Nintoka tomb, it's probably a pit that's dug just kind of through the top. I'm not sure how deep it is, again, because nobody's really gone on here to do an excavation. Um, but most of the larger tombs are not kind of down below. Um, it's not like this tomb, for instance. And these, these tombs, these smaller ones, are really coming from the later period. And that's when we start to see the construction of more of these uh, burial chambers. And with the, sm the construction of smaller tombs, we don't have the moats quite as frequently. There are still some, and it's, things do get waterlogged and destroyed that way. Yeah. So have they actually found any bodies still in the tombs? Yeah. Have they done any DNA testing to see where they It's, um, I don't know necessarily about DNA testing, but yeah, this is the one I want. Um, in this tomb, um, pretty much uh, most of the tombs have a stone sarcophagus or a wood sarcophagus with some remains still inside. Um, in the case of the Fujinoki tomb, when they opened the sarcophagus, it actually had two bodies inside of it, um, one male, one female, um, and it was filled with also all sorts of gold objects. Um, it's also filled with water which probably happened um, through seepage over time, and that caused a lot of things to get destroyed or kind of fused together with rust. Um, but I don't know about any DNA analysis, if that's been done. Because one of our previous speakers, as we mentioned, that the Imperial family probably is one of the reasons they didn't want people going in there and then maybe doing DNA testing and saying, oh yeah, you are descended from Koreans and they don't like that right. idea of having Korean blood. I mean, it, I don't think it would be, it's not unexpected that they'd have some Korean blood or even be purely Korean, but sometimes finding those DNA markers that determine, I mean, certainly they're not Jomon people that are in here, which are very distinct, I think, DNA markers. Um, but the kind of Korean-Japanese distinction, I think, would be hard to tell. Um, but that said, I don't think the Imperial Household Agency wants to necessarily have that in the books, where you do a DNA test and it's like, this is definitely a Korean person, and they're uh, directly associated with the Imperial line. It's again, one of those touchy subjects because a little bit of um, kind of a Western bias myth has gotten mixed into it, and it's hard to know to what extent um, that's really a fear. What's the shadow part now? 
uh, that's my crappy picture. <laughs> no, basically when I got to this tomb, there's a door there, like a, just kind of a steel door with a little window. And so I put my camera up to the window and took a picture. There are lights inside though that have been placed. Um, I should say that most of these tombs are reconstructions. When they go through a process of excavation, it's usually complete excavation. They kind of get rid of the entire mound. Um, I mean, the sarcophagus and probably this tomb um, structure inside is uh, distinct, but the mound itself probably has been remade. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just gonna run to this just quickly. That's why this one looks so manicured and nice. It's because this one's a complete reconstruction. There's nothing original in that one, yeah. Yeah. I heard that for like but early, some Viking burials, mm -hmm. they put one third of the property or gold in the tomb, mm -hmm. even be sunk in a ship. One third was for the party, right? <laughs> and then one third went to the family, right? Or the was the gold and the precious objects that went in here? Was it more like a token, or was it a substantial part of the? You know, it depends on the tomb. Uh, most of the Japanese tombs don't have enough where it would be, you know, it, like a huge portion of the estate. I mean, the tombs, even the Fujinoki tomb, which is one of the most lavish kind of collections, a tomb isn't that big. It's, it can fit the sarcophagus and maybe a, a little bit more, but um, there certainly was a lot more of their, their collection that was begin going on to the family. So what's thought is that there were some um, probably a number of things that were uh, placed in there, but yet yeah, not the whole, but not, like a not the whole shebang, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. So the, the paintings on the two walls, it seems like they were abstract, in terms of, like this, this beautiful abstract, and then that very realistic picture of mm -hmm. the people with the umbrella. Is there a large separation in time between that sort of? No, but there is a large separation in space. So these more abstract paintings, and actually. Um, I think, not this one, but um, this is fairly early 7th century, I believe. But this one and a lot of the other paintings are coming from the very far so uh, southern island of Kyushu. Um, and it's thought that maybe the Honshu and uh, Kyushu cultures were different. Um, the consolidation of power really starts to happen kind of um, to the east of Kyoto, uh, an area called Nara, and the Osaka kind of um, Harbor Basin. That's where we see the most proliferation of tombs and a lot of um, kind of the development of culture during this period. So it's thought that they might have been a little bit of a different culture. Maybe the southern tombs were um, had something else going on. Yeah. Are there tombs up in Hokkaido? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, Hokkaido is probably where a lot of the um, the hunter gatherer tribes from earlier were. Um, they kind of stayed intact for a while and they became, um, we think they may have become the Emishi culture from later on, and they're more distinctly uh, related to the Ainu that are there now. We think, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not totally sure I'm making those connections, but um, I don't think there was any tombs up there. Do yeah. you think that originally the, the, the circles and the red wall were solid, or were they painted with those Things, or is that oh yeah, they were probably solid. Um, right, I think, well I think those are kind of like little rocks that have kind of come through. Uh, probably over several centuries a lot of the pigment has come off. So originally it would be just a solid? Probably. I mean, it depends how well they painted to begin with. Um, um, I mean, painting on raw stone doesn't usually take terribly well. So probably uh, a lot of this pigment just flaked off over time. and. Uh, with the opening of the tomb also, usually a lot of mold and um, with the oxidation of tombs when they get opened up, um, sometimes things get damaged. Yeah. We were told during the terracotta that um, the Germans are trying to come up with a, a camera that can you know, go down at the tomb right. to check inside. Right. And that's what they actually were doing with the um, Takamatsuzuka tomb. This was actually like they had a little kind of a fiberscope camera that they placed into the tomb first. Um, they also did that uh, with the Fujinoki tomb. Most of the tombs now, they like to check it out before they open up to make sure they're not gonna destroy anything by opening the tomb. And that is why a lot of the terracotta warriors haven't been excavated because with the original, right, um, it's gonna be extremely expensive to do. 
Um, the soil there is laden with mercury. And um, I know with the original Terracotta Warriors, when they kind of when they excavated it, just within minutes, the original painting was gone. Yeah. So most of what we have now is repainted, of course. Yeah. Yeah, when here, they did a sample of what one looked like. Right. Painted. Yeah. Are you going to actually be excavating when you go back? I hope to. And are, so is there still a lot of ongoing excavations in Japan? Yes, there is. Uh, Japan is a very archaeologically centered country. Uh, there are thousands of excavations every year, um, and several of Kofun themselves. Do um, they ever take volunteers? Yes, from they do. Other countries to go? They take volunteers, um, both students from other countries. They take volunteers from the local population. Um, it's actually a the general public in Japan is extremely ex uh, excited about archaeological finds. They make front page news in a lot of the papers. Um, and local communities, when there's an excavation going on, very frequently if it's, um, there's, uh, this all started back in the 1950s with a kind of a communist movement um, that was in Japan, uh, and especially within the academic communities. And this was kind of a way of getting away, away from the kind of the shame of the imperial family and World War II and the uh, atomic bombs. So there was a lot of a push to kind of a communist peoples-based kind of system. And archaeologists themselves were very active in this, and they, this led to a lot of uh, excavation traditions where they started bringing in local peoples, um, and usually excavations were under the kind of the direction of a few archaeologists, but with most of the labor being done by volunteers. And that kind of tradition, the communist part has kind of faded away, but the rest of the tradition has really stayed intact. So there's a lot of interaction with the community, a lot of volunteer support. So it would be pretty difficult for somebody like coming from here to be able to go over as a volunteer because they would use the local people? Yeah, it would be tough if you just kind of went over there and just did it, but if you did make a kind of um, connections with some of the archaeological centers, it probably is possible. Um, and I know that Berkeley uh, in the past, and I've been on one of them, um, one of our professors, Junko Habu, is, uh, does Jomon period archaeology, and she leads classes. Um, I don't know if she's going to do it again, because the last few apparently were a little bit trying. Um, undergraduates falling in rivers and what have you. But, um, <laughs> um, but uh, we had a lot of interaction. <laughs> Uh, and they were, it was, it was actually a, a Berkeley led archaeologist, or like dig, was then some of, every once in a while, the local archaeological center uh, would kind of come by and just check in. And so there's a lot of kind of openness to a lot of these sites. And the fact that we have just, I mean, Japan is littered with um, hunter gatherer sites, littered with these tomb sites. There's things to find everywhere in Japan. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's the other thing. Japan is very kind of isolated as far as their archaeological practices go in many cases. Um, and they have so much data, but it's very rarely translated outside of Japanese. Um, so there's really not a lot of people in America who are looking at this stuff, um, aside from uh, what we do find in the museums are usually great. And the Asian Art Museum here has a fantastic collection. Um, but um, not as much scholarly work being done here. In Japan, it's a huge field, but it just doesn't trickle over very much. Yeah. I have a question about current burial practice. Yeah. So, you know, there's so much value clearly placed on, you know, this historical treasure. Right. Um, no, and it really, basically when we have these kind of final tombs, uh, this is about the time where uh, there were some tomb building being done after this and some kind of inhumation burials. Uh, but for the most part, Buddhism kind of replaced that tradition. And even with these tombs, um, and during the same period, uh, cremation was becoming much, much more popular through kind of the Buddhist traditions. Uh, and I think that's the primary way that people are buried now in Japan. There are, of course, some Christian burials. Some of the shoguns have tombs, um, but usually they're cremated. All right, if there's number of questions. Well, thank you Great, well, thank you very much. <laughs>